Hey guys, I'm here to do my July wrap up. I have 14 books to talk about and I'm really happy because I just hauled eight of these in July. As usual, I'm going from least favorite to favorite. Let's go. First up is Heather, The Totality by Matthew Weiner, who was the writer, creator, executive producer, and director of Mad Men. This is an art copy that was sent to me by Steve Donahue because this is coming out in October of this year. This book is garbage. Uh, it's a tiny little thing, only 130 pages, so that's the best thing about it. This follows a wealthy New York couple named Mark and Karen who have a good but passionless marriage. The best thing in their lives is their daughter, Heather, who's not only the most beautiful child in the world, but also the most angelic. They can't believe how wonderful Heather is. And it's not just them. Even people on the subway regularly are touched by Heather's perception and compassion, even when she's a child. It's also about a violent sociopath named Bobby who's working on the construction site on Mark and Karen's apartment complex um, and starts having rape fantasies about Heather, who's now a teenager. Um, this is how we're introduced to Bobby. Robert Klasky was born in Newark, New Jersey, to a single mother in the public hospital. Bobby, as he was called, was a miracle unnoticed by the medical staff, since they were unaware that his mother had rarely consumed anything other than beer during her mostly unacknowledged pregnancy. He was born with his mother's last name, since his father could have been any number of people who had Bobby's mousy brown hair and blue eyes. I've never read a paragraph that packed in that many cliches. Um, and when I was first reading this, I was trying to think of generous interpretations, like maybe this is a parody, um, or maybe Weiner's trying to start off cliche and, and then he's gonna twist and, and take you somewhere interesting. That never happens. This is the most unimaginative book I've ever read. Hands down. Here are some more sample descriptions, again about Bobby. His urges had been denied so long that they now grew into a low hum of need, constant in his body like a spring was being stretched through his limbs. And no one's ever described anything like that before. Um, and another one. After Bobby meets Heather. That night in his motel room, Bobby lay rigid on the bed, staring at her face on his phone, knowing that now that their eyes had met, and because she was so precious to all, she would be his wafer and wine. Throughout, there's no psychological development, no insight, nothing ever goes beyond surface level, no drama because you couldn't care less about these characters because nothing feels real. Why did Weiner write this book? And yet, this is what the author Michael Chabon has to say about it. Heather, the totality is a tour de force of control, tone, and razor slash insight. In its clear-eyed anatomist's gaze and its remarkable combination of empathy and pitilessness, I hear echoes of Flaubert and Richard Yates with a deeply twisted twist of Muriel Spark at her darkest. I could not put it down. <laughs> oh my god, I almost like hyperventilated when I read that. I was like, what? I mean, even if you're friends, which I'm assuming you are, how dare you take Flaubert's name in vain? The thing is, all of the decent reviews this is getting on Goodreads, of which there are already a fair number, are from people who say they watched and loved Mad Men. Now, I haven't watched it, but I'm assuming there's some serious transference of tone happening for those who have, because this book is toneless. And I, I really think it was a case of a TV writer who's used to putting words down on paper and then having people add background music to them um, and actors add their flair to them. But when you're a novelist, you are responsible for bringing everything to life. And Weiner just didn't do that. Like a lot of people, I would like to write a book someday. And I often read great books and think, oh God, like I couldn't, I couldn't do this. And then there are books like this one that I read and think, oh no, I could, I could definitely write a book if I vomited my brain on a page and carrier pigeoned the manuscript to a publisher through a thunderstorm, it would be better than this, I, so there's that. The other book that was seriously not good but still leaks better than that one was Assassin's Quest by Robin Hobb. This is epic fantasy. It's the third book in her first trilogy in the Realm of the Elderling series. It's called the Farseer Trilogy and in it um, we follow a boy named Fitz from the ages of six to around 20 in this third book. He's a bastard member of the royal line. I'm not going to go into more plot than that. If you want to know more about this trilogy or any of Robin Hobb's Realm of the Elderlings books, I'll link great videos down below from Mercedes at Mercy's Bookish Musings and Sam at Sam's Nonsense. Basically this book was 850 pages long and it easily could have and should have been 
400 pages and you know it's a shame it was a slog uh, but I really love these characters and the world that Hop created but I just don't think I'll ever be a big epic fantasy reader because so often indulgent writing and lazy editing are overlooked in the name of world building and I had to stop reading a series like Game of Thrones for instance even before the TV series started because those books were so bloated and with Assassin's Quest we don't need to know every time Fitz uh, bathes, everything that he eats, every time the wind changes direction, every thought he has, especially when he's thought that same thing many times before. It was just so unnecessary. Um, so the trilogy overall was okay. I liked the first book especially, but I only finished this third book because I wanted to go on to the Life of Traders and Tawny Man trilogies. Then there's a poetry collection called Another America by Barbara Kingsolver, which I already talked about in my book Tubathon wrap up, which I'll link down below. And then we have the YA book Allegedly by Tiffany D. Jackson, which I also read for the book Tubathon. Then I have a graphic novel called Fun Home by Alison Bechtel. This is a memoir about her family, especially her relationship with her late father. Bechtel grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania in, in this big old house that her father was obsessed with restoring um, and they all pitched in at their family's funeral home which they called the fun home and this focuses on the process of Bechtel realizing and expressing that she was gay and the parallel experience of learning new things about her father's sexuality. I loved the artwork in here. This is what it looks like. I really, really liked it. Um, but Bechtel's super highbrow and she uses a ton of literary references to things like Homer and Joyce to try to make sense of her father, partly because he was an English teacher and, and loved reading. Uh, and she explains these references. She doesn't leave you adrift if you haven't read these books, but everything is so intellectual that it feels completely removed, which is supposed to simulate her father's love, but I found it hard to remind myself to finish this book. Um, my favorite parts were when she quoted from her childhood journals. Oh my god, I could identify with those so much. I thought they were hilarious. Um, so this isn't spectacular, but I do recommend it if something about it has caught your interest. Bechtel's family is definitely interesting um, and worthy of a graphic novel. Next is the novel Hood by Emma Donahue, which I read for the Booktubeathon. Next is a children's book Skating Shoes by Noel Stratfield, who wrote other books like Ballet Shoes, Theater Shoes, and Dancing Shoes about child performers. This is about two little girls who become best friends through skating. One, Harriet, has been ill and she only starts skating to strengthen her muscles. And the other, Lala, um, had a dead father, <laughs> had a dead father, duh, um, who was a star skater. And Lala has been told all her life that she's going to grow up to be a world champion. But then as Lala's interest in skating fades, Harriet's talent grows. I love Stratfield's writing because she's so um, observant and gently wry and compassionate towards human nature. Um, this is my least favorite of the shoes books so far because the other ones had a lot of theater and dance in them and this one doesn't have a lot of skating and almost no performances which were my favorite aspect of the other books. So I do recommend this one but don't start with it. If you want to get into the shoes books start with ballet shoes or dancing shoes. Dancing shoes is my favorite. Next is a tiny pamphlet type thing called Dear Ijeowele or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Adichie's friend Ijeowele wrote her after she had a daughter um, saying, God, how, how can I raise my daughter feminist? And Adichie wrote these notes for her and formed them into 15 suggestions. Now just like Adichie's other feminist pamphlet, We Should All Be Feminists, this is kind of a cash cow because Adichie's publishers aren't stupid. She's a big deal um, and happily feminism is a buzzy topic at the moment. So this is less than 100 pages and, and it's priced about the same as a normal book. Um, but even recognizing that, I love this pamphlet and the other one um, because Adichie expresses things so simply, eloquently, and unapologetically, and even committed feminists like me um, need an occasional reminder of some of the basics, you know, to, to ground us. And I think that this and We Should All Be Feminists are perfect introductions for anybody who has foundational questions about feminism. Next is The Good Immigrant, edited by Nikesh Shukla. This was all over booktube last year, and I read it for the Anna and Eric book club, which I'll link down below. 
This is a series of 21 post-Brexit essays by British BAME writers, which stands for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, about the experience of being othered in their own country. And the topics range from fashion to TV to airports to education and so much more. I could tell that all of these writers would be talented in one medium or another. A fair amount of them weren't great at the 10-page essay format. Some of them were um, super academic and a little boring, um, and others just had too many ideas floating around, maybe because they were resisting oversimplification, but they just ended up not driving anything home in a memorable way. That being said, a lot of these essays are fantastic, so well written, they engaged me immediately, they made me laugh or cringe or sigh, they made some brilliant points, and they got out. So I do recommend this book as a whole, you're gonna get a mixed bag of essays, but the great ones make this an eye-opening, entertaining read. Then there's a play called The Children's Hour by Lillian Hellman, Booktubeathon. Next is the novel History of Wolves by Emily Fridland, which was just longlisted for the Man Booker 2017 prize. I made a review video on this where I also talked about my admittedly vague definition of literary fiction, so that's linked down below if you're interested. Two other novels that I reviewed together were The Clay Girl by Heather Tucker and Nine Folds Make a Paper Swan by Ruth Gilligan. This was the other book that I read for the Anna and Eric book club this month. I made a joint review on these that I'll link down below. I talk about why I love these books, but also get into some criticisms. I read two fantastic five-star books this month. The first is Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. I don't have my physical copy anymore because I lent it to my grandmother, but if you want to hear why I think it's wonderful, I talked about it in my book two with on wrap up. And my absolute favorite book of the month was The Lie Tree by Frances Hardinge. This, I just love this book so much, okay? I'm gonna do a joint review on this one with some other books at the end of August, but for now, I'll just say that you should all read it. It's so good. Those are all the books that I read in July. It was a month of soaring highs and bitter, bitter lows. Uh, let me know your thoughts on any of them down below and I'll see you soon for another video. Bye guys. Thanks for watching.